Welcome mountain mamas. Today's uh, first aid lecture is going to be on acute mountain sickness, AMS. And um, this is something that's um, really personal to me. Uh, I have to, okay, you guys don't usually get personal stories at the beginning of these lectures, but um, so I've had a chance to do some high altitude trekking up to 21,000 feet, I think is the highest I've been able to do. Um, uh, in the lower 48, the highest summit that we can do is Mount Whitney in California at 14,000 something, something, I don't remember. And in the United States, it's 19,000 something, something up in Alaska and Denali. Um, in the Western Hemisphere, it is Aconcagua, which is 23,000 feet. That's the one we were attempting to do. Um, and, and of course, in the whole world, we've got Everest um, over in the China, Nepal area at 30, uh, 32, no, I shouldn't know that. Yeah, husband says that's close enough. <laughs> anyway, so we've got some high mountains out there, but in, the, um, in Utah, where we are gonna be doing most of our hiking, um, our highest summits get up to 11, 12,000 feet. So that's about as high as we get up here. So um, I think Mount Kings Peaks are highest at 12,000 something, something. I'm not a numbers person. And my, our lead guide, Aaron, would be able to tell you all the stats. But just know that most of the people that are living here on the Wasatch Front, we're at either four or 5,000 feet in elevation. So we can take an easy drive up to the Uintas um, in an hour or two and be up at as high as 10,000 feet out of the parking lot. So there is a chance that when we do hikes um, here in Utah, that we can be hitting some altitude. And we've had some situations with altitude um, in the past trip, in our past trips. Um, Marilyn, do you want to unmute yourself and share an experience of altitude sickness uh, that you have learned uh, or experienced uh, yeah. from so yourself or had, others? You, you uh, might want to make yourself loud and talk close to your microphone. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so we did a hike for Mountain Mamas uh, going up to Nebo. And we had a great group of, of Mountain Mamas who I had hiked and done outdoor adventures plenty of times before. Um, and I was in the back of the group and we're hiking up. Uh, we're just starting from the parking lot, the trailhead of Nebo. Uh, but we're already up. I don't know. What would you say? Like 9,000 something. Yeah. Eight or well, probably eight something. Yeah. Yeah. To start. So we're hiking up and in front of me is a gal who I've done loads of outdoor adventures for and with, and she's very go-getter kind of a gal and she's awesome and she's right in front of me and she's um she's hiking but she's hiking like drunk honestly was the best way that I could describe it like she was very tipsy um and her pack I mean like it's a lot your pack is a lot but I was like something's up here um so she hiked uh, but she was getting very stumbly. I mean, we're talking from the get go and, and we've seen other people who, you know, maybe it comes halfway through, or maybe it comes from the saddle to the peak of Timp. Um, anyway, but, uh, it, she just wasn't looking good. And so, uh, we asked her about a headache. Um, that can be, that's a, a big sign is if you have a headache that will just not go away and her headache wasn't going away. And we, we were kind of just watching her as we got higher. And if it was getting worse as she got higher. Um, and it was like her coordination, things just weren't there. Um, and that was really concerning to us. And this was, this was more than just um, tired or you know not, not up for it kind of a thing. Um, something else seemed to be up. So we were watching her. Luckily her sister was there um, and could stay with her. But yeah, and, and go and end up going back. The only thing for high altitude is to just get off the mountain to go, go back. And as you go back, your headache goes away, but, but going higher can cause some major problems. I'll let Emily tackle that, go for it. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That was, it's a, it was a prime example of um, not expecting. I mean, we were in a high hike and we didn't, you know, she wasn't presenting, she was presenting with some classic symptoms and some um, more rare symptoms. So it was good to kind of, um, yeah, I really like to sh you to share that story because it kind of helps um, keep, let us know that we need to keep an eye on many things, um, symptoms of that. So um, yeah, we'll get to talking about that in a little bit, but just want you to know that this is something that can hit on any hike. And especially if we have any ladies 
that are coming that might be guests of friends and things that are coming on a hike that may have come from California or the coast, either east or west coast, where they've been coming from sea level to Utah, just from that coming from you know sea level up to 5,000 feet, even our foothill hikes can still put them at risk for altitude sickness. So we want to kind of keep on radar on all the women in our group and where they've been from, where they're from, and kind of their experience. So, um, so the the risk factors that we generally look at is if we're doing any hikes over 10,000 feet is kind of our our it's kind of on our radar. And it's something that we really want to discuss with our women. So those will be Mount Timpanogos, Nebo. We're trying to do high summits at least one or two every year. So any of those high summits. We want to keep an eye on our ladies and do a little education before um, or anytime, like we said, we do any significant increase in elevation. The symptoms are headache that's not going away, increased fatigue that's abnormal for this person because everyone's going to be tired on a hike, but something that's like they're more tired than normal. So that's kind of weird. Nausea, loss of appetite. They don't want to eat. They're like, I just don't feel like snacking on this hike. Um, if you're doing an overnight, they're just not sleeping at all, which some of these, <laughs> I'm just saying, and shortness of breath. So those um, symptoms are things we want to kind of keep an eye on. Some of these just are like going to happen to all of us on a hike anytime, it's just for having a bad day. But if you're starting to notice a few of these and they're not getting better, and especially if they're getting progressively worse as we're getting higher in elevation, I like to say, if you start getting a headache, um, you know, take some uh, ibuprofen profen or Tylenol or just pound that fluid over the next hour. And if in an hour it's not better and it's worse, then that's someone we're watching for altitude. Same with nausea, things like that. Um, loss of that, any of these symptoms that are getting progressively worse and worse as we get higher, like Marilyn was said. Um, let me, Emily, let me, you just mentioned loss of appetite. I think that's a big one is because I also recently on a Tim Pike had a gal and I wasn't sure if it was altitude sickness or not, but um, just getting, uh, for her, getting more water into her system and getting more food into her system was a big deal, that things improved um, with that. And so that's how I was kind of, I felt like I could rule out the altitude sickness for her because she improved with food and with, and with like rest and breaks. Whereas the other gal, like there was nothing to be done. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, what you're saying um, is really important, a point uh, that the treatment for just um, the beginning symptoms of acute mountain sickness is light exercise, hydration, 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 and then eating. Um, those three things can really help improve altitude sickness. So I usually tell our gals like, you want to pound that water as we're hiking, <clears throat> especially when we do Timpanogos and things like that, like drink regularly, drink often, have a snack every half hour. I usually make sure I have a snack in my pocket. Just those simple things um, will really make a difference in preventing altitude sickness. Um, when I did um, hike to base camp of Mount Everest, we did that, just the trek as we hiked up and we were drinking like four liters of water a day to just keep our, that altitude sickness at bay. So we were peeing all the time too, but just know that like that is hydration and eating food is a great way to combat this. Absolutely. Um, if you are, if your trip symptoms are not improving, um, there's a saying, don't go up until your symptoms go down. So if our symptoms are not going down, then it's time for us to think about making changes. Now, the reason I say this is altitude sickness where you're like, no, oh, a little headache and nausea is not that big of a deal. I can, I can muscle through it. What happens is um, if we continue on towards um, and increasing our elevation, things in your body are changing that can cause a lot more severe um, injury to you permanently. Um, the severe symptoms that we want to watch out for or what this other gal was showing um, right out of the gate was loss of coordination. Um, that's kind of one of your big signs. It's like when things are going from like, okay, they got a headache and nausea. And now all of a sudden they can't walk. Okay, we've crossed a line. We have to get them off the mountain. Um, it's something like, it's kind of like those drug tests that all of you guys have done, right? No, just kidding. Um, is if you can, if they can't walk a straight line or if they can't close their eyes and stand straight, those two things are like two easy tests that any person can do um, and just see if that person can hang out. And if they're having issues with that, then we things have changed from like a mild to moderate case of altitude sickness to we're getting in the severe section. So we want to definitely make sure we um, um, evacuate those people and just get them down. Um, 
Some of the other two common, uh, not common, but like more extreme versions of altitude sickness are HACE, high altitude cerebral edema, H-A-C-E. Um, with this, um, your brain is affected. We're gonna have an increased headache, changes in their personality, seizures, and then a coma. Like it goes uh, in a not a bad way. Um, when I was on the same hike in um, Everest Base Camp, about halfway up, um, I think the highest we get on that on that hike is to 18,000. So it wasn't super high, but it still was pretty high. I think we were at maybe 16,000. We had a guy wake up in the middle, woke up in the morning, and essentially he looked like, he was a guy who was in his mid 40s, um, woke up and looked like he was an 80 year old with Parkinson's and dementia. Like he woke up, he was pale, he was shaking, he was um, incoherent. He didn't know where he was. He couldn't stand, he couldn't walk. And this is a like, like, a, like our regular guy who was a hiker. Um, and so um, we had the doctor look at him and right away, he's like, he's got haste and he's got to get out of here really fast. And he hopped on a porter. They backpacked him down to the nearest medical place. Then they actually helivacked him um, down to Kathmandu. So um, things like that can happen really fast. So the neurological things, um, cerebral, the haste, H-A-C-E is just think that's neurological. So we've got personality changes, headaches, um, loss of coordination, things like that. Anything that's going to affect your neurological system. Um, then the other one you can possibly get is high altitude pulmonary edema. So HAPE, H-A-P-E. Um, so this affects your pulmonary system. So you're going to see shortness of breath, um, a productive cough, they're hucking up stuff. They've got pain in their chest and their heart rate starts to go up. These are the people you've probably seen on Everest movies where they're coughing up like foamy pink stuff and they can't catch their breath. Um, in Aconcagua in South America, and we did that climb. I met a couple people that actually had hate and had to be evacuated. I met them on the plane, actually, as they were like on their way home. They're like, oh, yeah, I got hate on the mountain and had to get evacuated and stuff like that. Um, so remember that that is your pulmonary system. So if you start noticing someone, they've gone through all those other symptoms. And now we're starting to have shortness of breath, um, coughing, coughing, chest pain, increased heart rate that just know that it is now affecting their pulmonary system. And we um, need to, um, to start taking care of them immediately. So um, the evacuation and treatment for this is, well, the treatment for this is evacuation. It's the weirdest thing. Someone can be on the edge. These are like leading to very, very serious and permanent um, problems. Um, we need to get them off the mountain, um, down the mountain, down elevation. And it's the craziest thing. They'll just, symptoms will start to improve. So like Marilyn was sharing with this gal, um, we had her go with um, uh, a trusted guide and they took her down the mountain and her symptoms improved. And, um, with this situation, it would have been even better had they gone to the trailhead and then driven down to the valley. I think her symptoms would have totally gone away. They ended up staying there for a while, but um, you want to get people down, 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 as far down as you can, and still they start seeing symptoms result. The nausea is going to go away. The headaches are going to go away. Shortness of breath is going to go away. It's wild. So that's a, that's a good sign that you know it's related to altitude and not they've got a cold in the mountains is when you go down, all of a sudden they're like, oh, hey, I feel more of myself. I'm doing so much better. I've got my appetite back, all these kind of things. Like things will drastically improve. So um, when you're in the high, high mountains, that's especially important to, we want to start walking people down and getting them down as fast as we can, getting them down off the mountain. Um, severe, um, severe situations, hopefully we will never be in these situations. Um, but um, the treatment for, for really um, severe cases will be oxygen as well as um, for haste, the cerebral edema, um, they can give them Decadron medication and then HAPE. Um, they give them, um, for the pulmonary, it's uh, nifedipine or Procardia. Those are the two medications that really help oxygenate and get things doing better. And then, of course, if they still don't do well with that, they'll put them in a Gamow bag, um, which is kind of a pressure chamber, a portable um, hyperbaric chamber that um, forces oxygen into their blood to hyper or um, hyperoxygenate their blood. Um, but then they still need to be evacuated. That, that's what they did with our friend in, um, in Nepal, um, was he was put in a gamma bag till the helicopter came and they got him out. So um, let's hope we're never in those situations, I'm just saying. Um, do know that there's also a medication, if you are thinking you're gonna be traveling somewhere with high elevation, you can try taking a medication called Diamox. It's also called acetazolamide. I have taken this before. Um, I don't like it, but it is an option. Um, it makes sure, uh, it helps, this supposedly helps with the treatment, uh, preventing altitude sickness. It makes your mouth taste like metal. Uh, it's the weirdest thing. Um, it makes me sick. But, and I also, so I took it in Everest base camp in Nepal. 
it worked okay. Um, I didn't take it in Aconcagua, which was higher, and I felt better. So <laughs> I just you take that with a grain of salt, but everyone will react differently, of course. Um, the way to prevent altitude sickness, um, a big thing is you can hike high in a day and do crazy stuff um, generally, but you want to sleep low. Um, so we can still have altitude sickness symptoms, of course, in a day hike, of course, and we're going to keep an eye on that. But especially if we're going to do overnights or hiking up in the high winters and we're going to spend a lot of days over 10,000 feet, you know, we want to do something where you're hiking um, no more. You can hike as high as you want, but you sleep low and we sleep no more than like 1,000 to 1,500 um, feet above where you slept last, which is kind of hard when you're sleeping at 5,000 feet in the valley and then we end up going in the mountain. So ideal if you can start at a lower elevation and work your way up um, from out of that will really help with altitude um, sickness prevention. And then um, water, of course, we talked about um, a light exercise. We're not overexerting, but we are still exercising. It's okay to, to hike and things like that. And then a diet of that's high in carbohydrates, but low in fat actually really helps as well preventing um, altitude sickness, especially when you're hitting over 16,000 feet, which is nothing we're going to do about. But, but just know that that is a little tip. If you want to pound a few more carbs than you do um, your fat. And then, of course, don't take any sedating medications, sleep medications at night or drinking alcohol at night. Um, that also um, makes your altitude sickness, your more risk for altitude sickness. So anyway, that's our lecture for today. Do you ladies have any questions? No? Good. Everyone's good. Give me a thumbs up if you are good. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us for today's lecture. We hope to never have problems, but we will always talk about this with our ladies. Always talk about this with your friends. Say, hey, keep an eye on me. I'll keep an eye on you. Um, and, and don't be afraid to walk off a mountain. As Ed Veester says, the guy from Seattle who's climbed the highest, all the 8,000 meter peaks in the world, getting home. No, I'm going to ruin it from the beginning. Getting to the summit is optional, but getting home is mandatory. So have a wonderful day. <laughs>